Welcome to week five of the History of Rock, part one. Uh, this week we're going to talk about the American response to the British invasion. Just to review our story up to this point, um, we t we've already talked about that first wave of rock and roll between 1955 and 59, all those folks like Elvis and Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, Fat Domino, and the way in which uh, much of the energy of that sort of dissipated by the time uh, we get to the end of the 1950s, into 1959, you know, February 1959 uh, being the day that uh, Buddy Holly uh, went down on the plane crash and uh, often called the, sort of the, day, the day the music died. Then we talked about that period between the end of the 1950s, the first half of the 1960s up to 1964 when the Beatles arrived, and asked the question, was this, um, was this uh, a great period for pop music, or was this in fact a kind of a dark age as between Elvis uh, and the Beatles? Uh, then the Beatles arrived in, the February, in February of 1964, and in, with, with, with the rise of the British invasion, the impression is always given that, um, that it changed rock music uh, considerably, especially changed the American market, because you know, that period between 60 and 63 had been all about trying to find the next Elvis. And it turned out that none of the things they did during 60 through 63 were actually the next Elvis. It turned out the next Elvis were the Beatles. And of course, the Beatles coming from England, that's the first time an English group, a British group, had ever really um, uh, broken through in America uh, in, in the way the Beatles did so in many ways the, the two sort of uh, uh, big figures in our history so far are Elvis and the Beatles. When this British invasion occurs as I said, it, 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 it doesn't disrupt as much as many historians or, or music journalists will often say, but it did dis disrupt the American music business a lot. A lot of American musicians felt like uh, these British musicians were, were really um, taking part of the business uh, away from them. And so what we want to talk about this week is the response that American artists had during this period, roughly from the, the 63, 64 period up through about 67, 68, although by the time we get done this week, we'll have pushed some parts of our discussion up to the early 1970s. So let's, let's start now talking about the American response. Start with uh, probably the most important American figure, arguably the most important American figure in our history um, uh, for the 1960s, and that's Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan's importance here is that he establishes a kind of a new model of what it is to be a songwriter in popular music. Uh, up to now, our, our model has really been the brill-building kinds of songwriters, you know, the professional uh, songwriters who, who um, who uh, uh, wrote songs almost by order in a, in a kind of craftsmanly kind of talk, a kind of way. And when we talked about the Beatles, we talked about how they moved from that model in 64, uh, 63, 64, to something more like an artist model, Tomorrow Never Knows from 1966, uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane from early 1967. There's a real change from the craftsman model to the artist model. Well, Dylan is right in the center of all that, too, and there's a lot of interaction, really, between the Beatles and Dylan, and a lot of influence uh, going both ways. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Dylan. Uh, Dylan began his career in New York's Greenwich Village uh, in the early 60s, but as I've pointed out before, did not have his first hits as a performer really until the summer of 1965. So really those first few Dylan albums were really only known to people who understood what the sort of purest folk movement was. Not even the folk revival. I mean, the folk revival was really about Peter, Paul, and Mary. It was about the Kingston Trio, the New Christie, New Christie Minstrels, groups like that. Not people like so much like uh, Bob Dylan and even Joan Baez. Uh, Dylan, uh, born in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, raised in Hibbing. Uh, his uh, his uh, given name is Robert Allen Zimmerman, but changing his name to uh, Bob Dylan, the Dylan part coming from the influence of, of, of the poet Dylan Thomas. Uh, in 1959, he enrolls in the University of Minnesota, and his first uh, musical uh, interests were in rock and roll. I mean, a kid growing up, 1955 to 57, you're going to be listening to Chuck Berry and, and later Buddy Holly and Elvis. And so that's kind of what Dylan was doing, playing some guitar, uh, piano, and different groups. But with the ri rise of the folk revival, uh, Dylan got increasingly interested in folk and, and fa fashioned himself as a kind of a, 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 a folk singer, um, and very much in the, in the uh, uh, under the influence of Woody Guthrie. So he starts to play uh, the, the folk circuit around the University of Minnesota and that 
region. And eventually, he moves to New York City, to Greenwich Village, where that's really uh, where things are happening. Um, as I said, his early image, his early act, really based on, uh, on Woody Guthrie. Uh, Woody Guthrie, by that time, uh, was really quite ill with Huntington's disease and was in a hospital there. Uh, Dylan, as the story goes, would visit Woody Guthrie uh, quite often. And um, in many ways, uh, according to the the, the, the stories and the accounts that come from the folk communities almost sort of passed the mantle uh, from uh, Woody Guthrie to Bob Dylan as sort of Dylan that became sort of the new star or over a certain period of time became the new star of this, this folk movement. Uh, so Dylan comes to Greenwich Village. He starts to he starts to play around the different clubs. He sees what the other more experienced guys are doing and starts to imitate that. Uh, it's interesting that uh, people don't think about this so much, but early in Dylan's career, uh, a lot of his stage show uh, his 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 performing uh, had to do with his rapport with the audience and almost a kind of a, a a kind of a comedy thing that he would do sometimes a dry kind of comedy for sure nothing sort of slapstick or loungy about it but there was an element of him uh, you know clowning and fooling with the with the crowd a little bit we t tend to think about Bob Dylan as being sort of deadly earnest so much of the time or maybe just a little bit sort of sarcastic or ironic but in this case uh, he, he 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 really did uh, try to connect in, in there, in a minute, I'll talk about some of the tunes where you can sort of see this in the early stuff. So anyway, Dylan makes a, a, a great impression around New York uh, and is signed to Columbia Records by a fellow by the name of John Hammond in the fall of 1961. Uh, remember, this is all way before anybody really uh, knows who Bob Dylan is going to be. Uh, he releases this album, his first album called Bob Dylan in March of 1962, and it's sold really well. Poorly. Um, some, some reports are that it maybe only sold 5,000 copies in the first year. I mean, this is Bob Dylan we're talking about here. Uh, so, so much so that around Columbia Records, since John Hammond had signed him, uh, Dylan was sort of referred to as Hammond's Folly, right? In other words, he'd, he'd sort of made a, a, made a, a real misstep uh, with signing Bob Dylan. But Bob Dylan ended up signing with a manager by the name of Albert Grossman uh, in August of 62. And um, uh, uh, this guy Grossman really knew how to manage Bob Dylan's career, not unlike Elvis signing with Colonel Tom Parker uh, back in the in the mid 1950s. And what Grossman was able to do was to help sort of reshape Dylan, reshape the word, the the the, the ideas around him, uh, the, the the press on him, and. There was, there was some uh, friction between uh, Albert Grossman and John Hammond, and so uh, Hammond stopped producing uh, Dylan, and another guy came in, Tom Wilson. Now, I wouldn't normally mention that. That seems like a small detail, but Tom Wilson producing Dylan is going to play a, a bigger role in our story than, than, than just the Dylan early albums. Uh, that early, uh, The Free Wheel and Bob Dylan, his second album from May of 1963, is produced by Tom Wilson. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Dylan is getting a reputation inside the folk community, but it's not very well known. He's more, he's more known as a as a folk, as a songwriter uh, his tune blown in the wind uh, becomes a big hit for Peter Paul and Mary in the summer of 1963 Dylan also recorded his version of blown in the wind but his version of it even though it's maybe more uh, popular and better known to people now uh, back in the day uh, that that would have been seen as not suitable for radio play uh, Dylan's voice being not sounding very professional or very trained, and the harmonica playing to go with it, um, that it just it just wouldn't really have, have cut it by professional standards. So a smoother sounding group like Peter, Paul, and Mary were able to have a hit with one of his songs. Um, that album, The Times They Are a Change In, uh, comes from January of 1964. Uh, another side of Bob Dylan from August of 1964. And all these albums I've mentioned were essentially not really big hit albums uh, for Bob Dylan and didn't turn him into a performing star. They were more sort of catalog of his songs. Well, the, the, the idea of folk uh, performer, we talked about this when we talked about the period between 60 and 63, is that they, they uh, engage more serious issues than maybe your average teen idol or girl group does. And so Dylan was very much working in that tradition, and it meant that he was playing a lot of traditional songs, traditional folk songs that, that went back to the 19th century and even further back than that, that dealt with social issues, issues of you know, uh, social equality and justice and this kind of thing. But as he continued to develop, Dylan began to develop as a songwriter himself. Now, the idea of writing your own songs, uh, developing your own sort of language, is maybe a little bit and in became increasingly at odds with the idea of writing songs about the collective or being part of a kind of a, of a tradition in the sense of, of, of 
giving new meaning to traditional tunes. So in many ways, one of the criticisms that's brought against Dylan as he begins to sort of not only uh, develop as a songwriter, but begin to expand past the idea of the traditional folk singer, is that he took the we in folk music and turned it into a me. And that move from the we to the me um, is, is, is in doing so, he's really creating the singer-songwriter model, which so many were going to follow after him. Uh, think about the different kinds of songs that he did early in his career. Uh, Blowing in the Wind, for example, is a kind of social and political uh, kind of message. Um, uh, uh, but for the sort of comic kind of stuff, this talking blues thing he would do, where he would kind of josh and, 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 and make jokes and, and stuff like that. Uh, a great example of that is a track called Moto Psycho Nightmare from one of the early albums. And then there were romantic sort of almost kind of love songs like uh, a girl from the North Country. If you really want to hear a tune with it, really, I think, sets the, sets the standard of what the singer-songwriter thing is going to be, it would be Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, uh, as, as a great tune that sort of shows the craft of Dylan's songwriting and really starts to become what we're going to start to expect from singer-songwriters. And that's a long way from Don't Think, there's a big difference between Don't Think Twice, It's All Right and Blowing in the Wind in terms of the focus. Don't Think Twice, It's All, it's all Right is all about Dylan talking about a relationship that's gone bad uh, w w with, his, with his girlfriend friend and you know, blowing in the wind is all about social change and justice and this kind of thing and it's this trajectory away from the folk uh, toward the singer-songwriter which is going to be Dylan's important contribution. In the next video we'll talk a little bit more in depth about how folk rock was born and how Dylan's change during this period leading up to the summer of 1965 and, and his, his, his change toward being more of a singer-songwriter and his turn to electric instruments really became an important part of the American response to the British invasion.